Yeah. To uh, estimate the height where you are on the sphere. Mm. Well, uh, no, not exactly. So if you think about it, if you have three spheres, if you have two spheres intersecting, then you get a circle. If you have a third sphere inter intersecting that, then you get two points. And one of the points will probably somewhere out in space so that you can, you can discard that. So you could actually calculate the, um, the position using three satellites. Can you check if the data is correct? Yeah, that goes in, in the right direction. The, the um, important part here is that it's very difficult to calculate the absolute time of arrival for the signal. Because for that to work, your uh, mobile device, your receiver would actually need a clock uh, which is as precise as the clocks in the satellites. And these clocks, because they need nanosecond resolution, are atomic clocks. Um, so they're still pretty big, uh, weigh a few kilos at least, and so you would need that for every GPS receiver. So that's probably out of the question. Um, the trick is now that you don't calculate the time of arrival, but the time difference of arrival. So you look at the signals, and you look at how much the signals differ from each other. And, but if you do that, then you kind of lose one degree of freedom. And to compensate for this, you need to add another satellite. So if you would be able to, to uh, calculate the precise time of arrival of the signal, then you could buy, get by with three satellites. But since you don't have uh, such an accurate clock uh, with you in your mobile device, um, you need to compensate. So in a sense, what you said about uh, checking for correctness is right. You need to compensate for that by using a fourth signal. So you need at least four of them at, at one point to actually calculate the, the position. And the more satellites you add, the more precise it gets, of course. Yes. Yes. Yes, but uh, if you have an internet connection, then it maybe has a, a round trip time of, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. And in terms of uh, time of flight, that's uh, even, so even if you have a round trip time of um, 100 milliseconds, and it's very accurate most of the time, and it only differs by one millisecond every time, then that's still like 30 or even 300 kilometers of offset in times of time of flight. So if you had a, a absolutely perfect connection which would reliably uh, get you the same uh, time to transfer data each and every time, then that would work. But, um, but it's in, in reality, it's far too imprecise, so the, the time delay between your device and the internet is far too uh, variable for this to actually work. Um, there is one aspect which you can use to improve uh, the connection using a, um, using a internet connection. So the, the signal which is sent from the satellites also contains information about uh, what other satellites are currently in view and so what, what frequencies, for example, you should listen to. And this kind of data you can also get from the internet, and this makes the, uh, the time until you actually get a position fix much quicker. Because otherwise you would have to listen for the uh, signal for maybe five minutes to get all the data. So it's actually um, 50 bits per second what's transmitted by the satellite, so it's a very low data rate. And to get all the, I don't know, 10 or 20 kilobytes uh, of information, you need to actually calculate the uh, satellite constellation and so on, and the other satellites to get all that data it may take five minutes. So if you've ever used an uh, old uh, navigation unit in a car maybe, um, then you may have noticed that sometimes it takes very long to start up. And this is the very reason. On a mobile device where you have an internet connection, you can get most of that data from the internet and can then use it to get uh, a position fix much quicker because you don't need to download all of this data f directly from the satellite. Uh, 
it's actually in the operating system. So there's, uh, in, for example, in Android, you have these different location providers, which are simply modules for somehow getting your position from the Wi-Fi or from the GPS or so on. And the GPS location provider um, downloads this data from some, uh, I, I think it's actually some American military server because the GPS is in the end run by the US military because it's so expensive. And um, from that server, you can get a small text file basically just describing um, what, what, satellite, uh, what satellites you currently need to listen for at what frequency. Um, due to this uh, military aspect, that's also worth mentioning what, um, what all uh, regular consumer devices use is just the coarse uh, GPS signals. There's also a precision signal which is um, encrypted with a specific key and that key is only available in military receivers, which is much more precise, of course. Um, the, uh, the interesting aspect of this is also, um, I'll actually mention this below here, but um, let me mention it here right now, since we're on the topic. Um, the US military has the ability to turn off the, uh, the CA signal whenever they want. And I think during the first Gulf War, they actually tried that for, uh, for a couple of hours. They just turned off the um, civilian part of the signal so no nobody else can use it. The one problem uh, which quickly became apparent was that uh, most of the American military units didn't actually have one of the precision receivers of the military ones. They just bought one at Walmart or whatever. And uh, then those receivers, of course, stopped working immediately. So it was very quickly um, turned back on because at that point, at least, uh, only very few military units actually had the precision receivers. But uh, the capabil capability is still there. Actually, um, until I think early 2000, there was this uh, so-called selective availability, which was an intentional error in the civilian signals. So you couldn't use it for um, really precise navigation at all. So there was an error of, I don't know, 50 meters, which was just introduced um, arbitrarily and which, which was of course missing in this uh, precision signal. All right, um, I already mentioned this, that you can yeah, sideload this, this almanac data about the other satellites. You don't have to download it from GPS. And what's also a possible improvement is so-called differential GPS. So you use a stationary receiver. With, for example, if you're navigating a ship, then you can uh, usually most, most ports have such stationary receivers which have very good antennas, which are mounted on a, on a platform with a clear view on, of the sky. And then you can use that stationary receiver to correct for errors. So for example, if you have bad weather and that bad weather causes um, reception, uh, reception errors, then the stationary receiver will get the same errors but you will know exactly where the stationary one is. And then you can use that to calculate a, a correction uh, factor and add that to your, to your moving receiver and get, um, get higher accuracy. All right, I've already, already covered most of this. Um, so just to summarize here. Um, Let's continue. Okay, yeah. That's already most of the things I wanted to mention about GPS. So most important aspect is time difference of arrival, not time of arrival, uh, because otherwise you would need a high precision clock in the receiver. Um, still has a high power draw and you need line of sight. And it's uh, still ultimately under, under military control. Um, I'm not sure, how, I think the same applies to GLONASS, so the, the Russians are probably also not giving all their secrets away. I'm not quite sure how it will work with Galileo, if it will have the full precision available to civilian receivers. Of course, that would be a big advantage, but 
I don't currently know what the, what the plan is. As I've mentioned, it's not, not yet fully operational, so we'll have to wait maybe one, two, three more years to actually see if that, if that will work out. So are there more questions regarding GPS? I think because it's expensive, because you need really high precision clocks, at least in the, in the transmitters. So for each satellite, you actually need an atomic clock. Um, so it's very, um, yeah, very expensive. And I'm, I assume that nobody has, has seen the need. So I think there are some special applications where you can have a, basically an additional stationary satellite on the ground, which transmits a similar signal as GPS, and um, which can then be used to improve the accuracy. But uh, again, it's just too expensive, I guess. So it would be possible to put that into base stations, but then they uh, would cost maybe 10 times what they, what they cost now. And so nobody does it. So, Yeah. Yeah. Still, still the same problem. If you're actually measuring uh, time distance, then uh, if you have an error of 10 nanoseconds, then you will get 100 meters of offset, even if it's just. So if you measure 400 or 600 meters, you're you're still way off, basically. Yeah. Actually, that's more or less exactly what we're going to, to cover next, cell-based location. It's not as good as GPS, but it can still come pretty close. Um, so 